Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, the drumming star from the hit TV series, Nashville, Chuck Tilly. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Rich Redman here. This is the Rich Redman Show coming to you live from Crash Studio, Music City, USA, Nashville, Tennessee. Of course, yeah, it's official. It is getting real. We have the <laughs> Rich Redman Show mugs. Of course, I'm joined by my friend and producer, Jim McCarthy, Jim yes. McCarthy, voiceovers.com. And I'm so excited about my guest today, Mr. Chuck Tilly. How are you doing, good to brother? See you. I'm it's great. so good yeah, to see you. It's great to Thank see you so man. much for being here, man. Chuck is been been a staple of the national music scene one of the top call touring and recording drummers for 32 years mm. we're dating ourselves i know and I know. when i met it's, you it's i had fun. black hair and you were well, me too you had more you had more pepper <laughs> you may have had a little bit more pepper <laughs> yes i did <laughs> um but no you look at you man you're vibrant you're full of youth man you're in great shape you know playing all the time yeah, playing all the time, you know, trying to eat right, and, you yeah. know, have good nutrition, eat right. Now that now I did see you late last sports. year, you were doing a gig with your band Six Wire in Vegas at the SLS oh, yes. Hotel. Yes, yes, yes. And I was your MC. Yes, you were. Uh, yes, our you our were. friend Jackie and Joni, uh, Jonas brought us in. Yep. Jackie and Joni. Did Jackie you watch that Joni. show? Uh, Jackie and Jonas, they brought me in to MC, which yes. was so fun. And then afterwards, we got crazy on some sake and oh, some yeah, Japanese sake. beer. <laughs> well, yeah, great Japanese food a lot of sake yeah that but was, i you know but good. i i've been here coming up on 24 years yep. and you know you and i always run into each other we'll see each other's cases in the hallway at a studio oh, yeah that's or right. at sir and that's we never right. get the hang i know that's true we're always doing different gigs or, yeah. or we might be on the same festival but you guys go on it at a different time yep. and so we never get to hang i know Which that happened a lot with when i was with alabama we'd be on the same festival and, and we'd be going on different times and we might see each other in the dressing room or something or yeah back. so so that sake and beer was long overdue yeah oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that was that was really really fun but look at this check out these credentials guys ladies and gentlemen if you're not familiar with chuck well you've been living under a rock here but check out all the people <laughs> that he's played for kenny rogers dolly Parker. Martin Al Jarreau, Richard Marks, Michael McDonald, Olivia Newton-John, Huey Lewis. The list goes on and on and on uh, by a really, really long, very accomplished musician. And um, you're just one of those guys that, you know, you had that... Uh, kind of like myself, the similar background, like yes. classical and jazz training. Yes. And yes. you're a great reader, which allowed you to move here and just swim in a lot of different circles. Yes, that's, you're right. We do have really, really similar backgrounds in that we both went to music school and had music degrees. And um, I, a lot, most of my college years were spent, you know, playing big band, yeah. you know, and orchestral percussion, mainly timpani. And at the same time, I'm playing in rock bands and playing bar gigs and frat parties and, and doing whatever was the top 40 at that time back in the 80s. Yeah. And so, you know, very, very similar backgrounds. Yeah. And, um, and just it always kept me busy doing different things, you know. And then I moved here and I focused more on learning the history and learning how to play country drums yes. and percussion and and really studying Buddy Harmon and, and, and Larry London and uh, Eddie Bears and all of our drumming heroes, yes. you know. And um, just, you know, immersing myself in that when I moved here. And then, uh, like I was telling you earlier, just... Uh, started doing sessions and doing sound alike sessions you know doing at that time it was karaoke tracks so all the major theme parks had karaoke booths where you know joe Schmo can walk in and sing along to a track yeah. and so nashville was a big center for that recording and so um in the mid and late 80s i mean he's still now but at that time it was really exploding and so um i would go in and do these sound alike sessions and, yeah. and do 10 or 12 songs a day and it was uh you know one song was whitney houston the next was uh metallica. madonna metallica <laughs> uh, motley Crue, ozzy uh dire straits uh, i mean that really speaks just, it was all over the map all that, over the map that really so. speaks to versatility and and having that yeah. training i tell people all the time yeah. look at if you if you learn your if you know for the drummers out there you know if you learn your rudiments and you're in a marching band you're in a concert band you know how to read a timpani part and then you get up and you play some you can play some count basie and some duke ellington oh, oh yeah this is a really great training ground for you to 
go play rock, play pop, play country. You have that bass. Yes, yes. You know? Yeah, and, and all that training really helped me when I got here because I, I was getting called to do not only those kind of gigs, but I would I would go do do society horn band gigs, and yeah. you're reading down, you know, reading down. Uh, Celebration uh, or well, YMCA. Well, yeah, yeah. Right, all of, all of that, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Commodores and Ohio players, all the horn band stuff, yeah. and they might throw in some jazz stuff through some standards, you know, here's the A-Train, you know, or here's some Duke Ellington, you know, Duke Ellington or Count Basie or whatever. Yeah. And, and uh, so I was, you know, wearing a suit and doing, doing country club gigs just yeah. to, you know, put food on the table. Did you play on the General Jackson ever? I never did that gig. You know, it's really. You know, it's I never really fu- did it. Uh, yeah, I, it's it's. I I think I filled in a couple times. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's. There's oh, a lot yeah. of these like little under the radar type gigs all oh, around a, town. Yeah, there was a bunch know. of them, and of course, when we first got to town, Broadway and downtown as we know it did not exist. There weren't a million bars downtown. There was only a handful. Yeah. And you had to schlep your drums to those bars and bring your drums. Really? There were no house kits. Tootsie's mm. had a house kit, but I never, I never played Tootsie's, but there was a couple of places you had to bring your drums in. I mean, oh my this God. is pre-mid-90s. You know, yeah, because just... when I moved here in 97, so it was like me, Jim Riley, Pat McDonald, um, yeah. that crew of guys, they started to have some Pearl and Mapex house kits down there. That's when it started, because yeah. prior to that, there was none of that. And so... And I was here just hacking around, would play some jam nights and whatnot, and there weren't that many house kits, so you would literally schlep your drums, and it was just it was a big pain. But but I got to play with a lot of cool people, and all those horn player guys, who are now all the A-team horn players, are all incredible players. I met those guys 25 years ago doing yeah. these 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 big society gigs and whatnot, and they're all top session players. But man, these guys were just doing, you know, they go out on weekends and do do conventions or or just, you know country club gigs or whatever. And, yeah. and uh, it was great for all. And everybody was a music major. Everybody went to North Texas or Eastman or Miami or Indiana, wherever. They're all those are the big great. Ones. Yeah, great players. Yeah, and, one more time for the kids that are listening and they want to go to college. Those those big four: Indiana. North Texas. North Texas. Um, uh, of course, Eastman and Juilliard are great. Eastern Miami. Juilliard, University of Miami. Um, uh, nice. There's Music at Musicians Institute. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. Berkeley. And then yeah, there's... Berkeley, uh, yeah, Berkeley. God, I forgot Berkeley. Yeah, a lot of Berkeley yeah, guys Yeah, UCLA, here. USC, yeah. Cal State, Cal Northridge. State. Yeah, Northridge. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, just the fact that you can read and play styles, you've been in a lot of house bands. So when I was just doing my research on you oh, today, yeah. look at all these house bands on television. A house band for Nashville star, Can You Do It, the next superstar, the na- the next great American band, a um, lot of all-star games, Stanley Cup. And, oh, and yeah. you have a rhythm section. Like I have a rhythm section. I've been playing with the same guys for 20 years. And you have a band called Six Wire. Six Wire. Tell yep. us about Six yep. Wire and how long you guys have been playing together. Oh, wow. Well, the core of the band, the... the Bass drums and uh, and guitar, Steve Mandel and John Howard. Yeah, um, we've been together playing together for thirty years. That's incredible. And we, in the or I guess mid nineties or so, we formed what would later become Six Wire, and uh, we were in Lee Greenwood's band together in the late eighties and early nineties. That yeah. was our first big artist gig and so when lee was in his heyday we were touring and you know doing 200 dates proud to be an american yeah and the simple crash on beat five right yes five four bar (laughs) (laughs) yeah nerd nerd alert (laughs) yeah okay for the layman what does that mean that means uh it was like proud and abandoned okay well what was the part of the song and they gladly stand up (laughs) on beat five it's not four four bars you know yeah yeah. five beats it's actually a you count it. You can count it two different ways, but yeah. um, we were his rhythm section for many years, and that's how we met. And then we all eventually left Lee's band to stay in town and do sessions and write and do you know other stuff. And we started writing together and doing a lot of recording together. And a lot of artists kept hiring us as a section, like oh, Phil Vassar and Carolyn Dawn Johnson and yes, a lot of different oh writers. God, yeah. So we got hired out as a section, and so. Our good buddy Andy Childs, who would become Six Wire's lead singer, he was a solo artist on RCA. He was Greenwood's opening act, and we got to know him, just a great, great guy, and him and Steve Mandel started writing songs together. And he's like, you know, this really sounds like a band, because we were going to record, it just sounds like a band. And so they started writing, and and Andy uh, left RCA and was just kind of writing and writing for EMI and doing different things. And next thing you know, we... We start a band and we would call ourselves the Remnants because we were all remnants of, 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 of record deals <laughs> and other artist bands and we were the Remnants, you know. So we'd play at Douglas Corner. 
uh, every other week or so. And next thing you know, fast forward, we get a record deal on the spot. Jim Ed Norman from Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers comes in, stays all night, loves the band, signs, gives us a record deal on the spot. A month later, we're in their studio recording and um, released our first single a few months later. And the first single, Look At Me Now, did pretty well. The video did really well. And, you know, we're off to the races. And then, and then it, this is great record, you know, record label, you know, History. Perfect storm of yeah. everything going wrong. Yeah. Yeah, the Time Warner AOL merger is happening in the middle of us launching our album and launching the second single. And um, um, Jim Ed left the label. He was the president. We were his pet. We were his act. He leaves the label. And a lot of a lot of artists at the same time started leaving the label. Like we were no longer a priority when the new regime comes in, new yeah. staff. And oh yeah, they fired the entire promotion staff as they're launching our record. You that know? happens it's every like, time. You know, like everything just just completely fall apart. So you know that was kind of a bummer. But we were always a working band. We were always working and doing stuff. And as soon as that happened, just through dumb luck, we um, we got hired to be part of the house band for Nashville Star, which yeah. is the most, at that time, was the most highest rated music show on cable. American Idol was was tearing it up on you know network TV and, and Nashville Star um, was doing really well in cable world. And that, so we, that's where we, we discovered became, Miranda Lambert, yeah, right? Yeah, Miranda, yeah. Uh, Casey Musgraves, Chris Young. Yeah. A lot of people came from that show. Well, we were the house band. And it, and it was it was structured just like Idol, you know. We we uh, but the the cool thing about Nashville Star though is it was live live, no tape delay. Yeah. So I did thirty something episodes live live, and so meaning you playing all the bumper music, you're playing you're you're playing going out of out into the commercial break and coming back in from commercial yeah. break, and then of course all the music for all the contestants, and then the special event music, and there was always a guest star too. You're backing up different celebrities. Yeah, so you know, if you can't so play with a great, click, and yeah, if oh, yeah, you yeah. can't read, and you can't play styles, you're then cooked. You're not doing it. Yeah, you're yeah. you're not going to be invited to that gig. Yeah. And so yeah, it was a heavy, heavy reading gig, and and every yeah everything was to a click because you you were on TV time, so you were arranging the song. A three minute song might be boiled down, mashed down to two minutes or a minute and a half or so, and so you had to be in a good arranger and know how to arrange the songs and still make them make musical sense. Yeah. You know, and then. Um, uh, know how to play all the different styles for the bumper music because they were all they were all over the map. You know, you'd play a Stevie Ray Texas shuffle coming into commercial and going out. You'd play, you know, a Soul Man Steve Cropper type groove. Yeah. You know, and then uh, it's just all over the map musically. And then that is so fun. And then one week you're playing with Jewel. The next week you're playing with Kenny Rogers. The next week you know you're playing with Gretchen Wilson. I mean, yeah. it's just you know, it's, yeah, it's all over the map. So we 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 that. Nashville Star led to us, the core of Six Wire, going on and doing many other shows for CMT Network. Mm -hmm. um, similar format. There was a duet show. There was another superstar type show that was, you know, kind of an American Auto for Country type thing. Yeah. Uh, I've done, you know, some CMT Video Awards. I've been in the house band for that a few times, and that's, yeah. you know, how that is. And, yeah, whenever and, uh, we play those awards, you know, we're. I know, I would see you at a lot of those yeah. award shows. I'm in the pit, you know, hiding, and you're up there with Jason on the big stage doing your one song. You I was know, like, look I'm, at those guys over there. They're working their butts off all yeah. night. Yes, yeah. I'm slaving away for a, you know, four hour show. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'd always heckle you guys, you know, when you would come out, you know. And, um, but those are always fun because you're the same deal. You're playing about 40 different music cues. And a big thing the drummer has to do is say when, when they introduce a guest presenter, you're playing you're playing the bumper music and the big the big challenge is as they come behind the curtain and start walking to the podium, you have to time as they're walking, when they're going to arrive and get to the mic and you gotta shut the music down on cue. And so you got a director in your ear telling you, Okay, stand by, stand by, three, two, and he's talking in your ear as you're playing and you're cueing the rest of the band on when to cut off. So oh you all God. have to cut off together when the presenter gets to the mic and gets in place. So that, that's always a great challenge of, of um, nailing that, nailing that the cutoff. Post. Yes, yeah. yes. So maybe Sticking they, the landing. Yeah, they started like using canned music on a lot of these productions yeah. because they could just 
duck the volume of the yes you know what but I mean? they want the sting at the end right? i know and yeah. so I, and that's my job everybody watches me to mm-hmm. go you know a big iq you know yeah. and so it, would it fall on would you would you find that it would fall on beats three four one or, or were you doing subdivisions and a fours no and stuff? i would always i'd always find the next downbeat gotcha because mm-hmm. uh, you, you can't you can't land on an upbeat somebody's gonna screw it up I mean, you got yeah. when you got a five or six peak span somebody's gonna screw it up you so, so i try to make it easy to land on downbeats and it was the same way with like the, the NFL draft. We we just did the NFL draft yeah. a month ago, a couple months ago. And where is that? And Downtown. That's here in Nashville. Oh, yeah, that was, was like two was biggest, the biggest. The biggest, yeah. Biggest one in history. The biggest in history. It's like 350,000 people. Downtown. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can really tell I'm a real sports <laughs> ball guy. <laughs> the biggest, most successful draft ever was in Nashville, in case you missed it. I know, it. there was like two days half of a million it. people on the street. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it there's was probably insane. there's probably just people just pooping on the street. You know what's funny about that yeah. day is that there it are just was... guys there waiting to become millionaires. That's the day yes. they become millionaires. You're right. They're crazy? sitting in the waiting room, just yeah. going, "My life is going to change in five seconds." Yep, as, or not as I know it. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, they're well, there the for first, a reason. The first rounders knew their yeah. life was going to change. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's what they televise is is mostly the first night's the first rounders, <laughs> and that's a three hour plus show. And you're on stage the whole time. There, you know, ain't no bathroom break. So you go right before you get up there. Then you get wired in, and you're on stage, and that's that. You know, I'd have a hard time with that. Yeah. Well, the second night we played two and a half hours, and we had like about a three minute break where they they tossed a video or some kind of presentation. So the whole band, we all run off stage, <laughs> run, run, pee, and, pee. Like, and, and of course they got porta potties. There's no permanent plumbing there. Oh, wonderful. You yeah. know, so we're all running the different porta potties, and everybody's got their you know all their their ears on and their their belt oh, yeah. pack and all their you know all their stuff. I can't imagine what those porta potties smelled like oh, after five hundred thousand people were using. <laughs> well, these are the special you know ones. The backstage special, the special the ones. Yeah, yeah, so the they special were poopers. Nice. But so. <laughs> Seeing five band guys <laughs> spread off stage, running over people and doing that, and then sprinting back, and getting in place before the camera comes back on. Hey, you better believe big, it. You went, big, big fun there. But, you know, when you but, know when you're in a in a band with, you know, we're in an aging band. Like our band is like 300 years old, like collectively, <laughs> because we because the you know our our uh, road manager says instead of like last shot or last whatever, it's like last P, everybody last P, we're walking in two, and then right, you know right. we just. You don't want to have to pee up there. Nah, yeah. Well, let me ask you something. I mean, sometimes we get those nights, all right? We we, we eat something bad. <laughs> you know? We try not you to got, do You that. got the old turtle head poking out. I mean, what, what do you... <laughs> What do you do? I mean, you is that how oh you pray gosh. to God yeah. to get that, to the show? The, <laughs> how know, does it affect your playing? I, I try to eat way before the show. Yep. I, you know, luckily, knock on wood, I've never had that problem... <laughs> In a major tour. However, yeah. on a tour in college, I was in Central America, got food poisoning, got some uh. bad shrimp in Guatemala. Uh, and I was literally, it was a State Department tour, so it's a jazz thing. You know, it's a jazz combo, and it's a, a wonderful tour. We went to Costa Rica and Guatemala and all these great places and, and, and played nice theaters and yeah. a couple of schools. And man, I got, I got food poisoning. And... Um, after the show and then I was sick all night and then we had like a, a midday show the next day at a school and I'm okay and it, it, but but uh, I something, had that cold sweat and you know mm-hmm. clammy and, and you're just you just you're sweating and it's really weird and man I had literally had a bucket behind the drum set during the show and and I was just feeling nauseous and you know I, I finally had to use it briefly uh, and was it's it coming out your me. face? No, yeah, thankfully. Okay. Yeah. Didn't that happen <laughs> to you? Thankfully. You said? Oh, yeah, no, I've yeah, definitely. But it worked. It worked, but I was literally behind the drum rider. And, and then, boy, I felt great. I was fine. Except you did it in your drum case, as you said. Right? Yeah, no, in the early days of LD, I got some food poisoning, and it was like, <laughs> one, two. <laughs> and I was just into so, a. And, and, but basically, you know, oh, yeah. into a high, from, from the audience perspective, you come back up, I and people know. are just like, oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> did, the, did the drummer just do what I think he just did? Hey, man, the drummer cannot stop. You couldn't, you couldn't see mine, but yeah. No, we can't stop. I mean, we're, we're you know. I used, to play in a, show. I used to play in a cover band, and I, I had to run off the stage, and there was no holding it. Yeah. One time. Yeah. I said, stall that's, the audience, guys. I got to Yeah, tell a joke. This thing. is where your skills as a that's front happened, person come That yeah. happened to our lead singer. He has a, a seafood allergy, and happened to him as we're um, – 
and Six Wire. Uh, we're in our radio tour doing this huge outdoor show, great show, big crowd, Sacramento, I'll never forget it. And we come to a point in the show, at the end of the show, where we do this big guitar medley. And he had just enough time to run off stage, become violently ill, while the two guitar players soloed and did this big jam for a few minutes. And he came back, and he looked great, and he was fine. Finished the show. No yeah. one ever knew. But he just he turned around and gave me that, that oh, my God, really, really panicked look and because it hit him toward the end of the show. It hit him. He, he has a bad... Um, seafood allergy, Ooh. and apparently there was some kind of seafood in our buffet prior to the show. Mm. <laughs> but it, but thankfully he ran off, you know, came back, he was fine, he was great, you know. But the only time that's ever happened, thank yeah. God. Uh, it's a, but these are the things nobody thinks Enough of these about. nauseous stories. I yeah, know. But, oh, they're interesting to me because they're you know it's well, they're, yeah. you're human. You know? Oh, it is. Yeah, I mean people. They, you know, oh, traveling, eating strange food, you, you'll you'll get some bad food. Something is going to happen. Yeah. I'm seeing I'm seeing something in the notes that's really piquing my interest here. Oh yeah, uh, the played, Warburton. You've played with Alex Lifeson. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Jim's that, a rush buff. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. Neil Peart shaped a lot of my playing. Like he did in so well, many everybody, people. you know, who, yeah. Yeah. Well, what's who that has, story? Who hasn't he influenced? <laughs> Alex is awesome. He's a he sweetheart. seems like a goofball, super nice. He is, yeah. he's hilarious. He's <clears throat> hilarious. And the situations where I've played with him is usually at the Warburton, and which is a big, huge charity gig that we do every year. It benefits St. Jude, and we've done it now for it's coming up on our 10th year. That's it's raised over 12 million dollars for. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Amazing. So every year we do it, and there's usually a dozen big stars. And we're at Six Wires, the house band, and, and it's all over the map. It's everybody from Alice Cooper to Michael McDonald to Michael Bolton to Terry Nunn of Berlin to Gretchen Wilson, uh, uh, Kim Carnes. Um, just the most incredible set of, of rock stars and mo- a lot of rock hall of famers you know, yeah. and, a, mm. and a few country artists as well uh, like this year Kobe, Toby, Keith, Toby Keith came in last minute yeah, you know, yeah. unbeknownst yeah. to anybody he just showed up he called an hour before hey I, I'm in the area I'd love to come to your show I was like oh my god okay let's go learn your music so we had to learn on the spot you know Couple of learn I mean, we know his hits but you know, we wanted to learn the right arrangements you know but anyway Alex so Alex comes to this event many many times and um we do it as a, uh, um, we usually just do it as a trio or maybe add an, a, an extra guitar player, like our, our guitar player, Steve Mandel, will, will play the rhythm guitar as Alex just is being Alex, which is awesome. Because a lot of the solos, you know, the, the, the rhythm guitar part goes away. So Steve would just play the rhythm part underneath while Alex is soloing. Like did, that, did that throw him off? I mean, is, is, is Alex used to playing no, we rehearsed. beyond the trio? Well, yeah, not really. <laughs> no, not really. But but he, he you know, thinks Steve is a wonderful player and he's a great mm-hmm. player. Steve could, Steve could play the role of Alex, you know, because Steve's like a smoking player. And um, and so we would play some of the better known Rush stuff, you know, like uh, Tom Sawyer and, mm-hmm. and Limelight and Spirit of Radio and um, stuff like that. And um, it's just like the record. He turns around and goes, okay, here we go. You know, he mm-hmm. starts Limelight and he starts Spirit and Tom Sawyer, I count off, mm-hmm. but we do it exactly like the live versions. Um, Did you have enough drums for, no. for Tom Sawyer? Yeah, I'll have it brought in. Yeah, I, I have. I a little bit out of my comfort zone. I had three three rack toms. Are you drum nerds? Three rack toms and two floors, and I'm normally just like two and two, yeah, or sometimes one and two, yeah. But three rack toms, two floors, about six cymbals, double bass, you know. Um, and so my mission was to, and I, you know, I already like anybody our age, I already knew the Rush stuff pretty well from memory, but I really studied it to make sure I was getting everything absolutely perfect to play it just like he's used to. Yeah. The first time I played with him, he had just got off the R40 tour. Just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just got off. So I was mm-hmm. like really nervous because he, they just ended the tour and he was in touring shape and just smoking and just like, okay, let's go, you know, and he could not have been nicer and really put me at ease. And we got through the show, and I had I had um, I had gotten some sheet music to Tom Sawyer, just to make sure I'd played it right, note for note. I, yeah. found, I found a really good transcription of all this Rush stuff. I think I bought that same book because I had to and, play some Rush with uh, the School of Rock kids. Oh wow! And so I got the book too. Yeah, well, I did that just to make sure I was hearing it right, yeah. and doing, and, and I was for the most part. And he 
And I showed it to him, and he laughed. He goes, oh, that's what it looks like. And it, like Tom Sawyer's three, <laughs> three pages. Yeah. And I literally had a double music stand, had it out. I didn't need it, but I had it out for rehearsal and just and reading it down. And he saw it. He goes, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. you know. And <laughs> and he signed it for me, and, and he signed it. And he goes, hey, man, great job. Are you busy next summer? Because <laughs> <laughs> our, I was our like, drummer oh, is retired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. You know, I'm like, oh, I'll be framing that, putting that on the studio. So, I mean, wall, you know, it's incredible. Could not From a layman nicer. like myself who grew up yeah. playing those songs in my parents' oh, basement. Too. It was okay. a, just pinch myself. Right. You, you're looking crazy. at him and, and you're like, yeah, okay, I'll play with you. That's cool. You, we're playing Tom Sawyer and he kind of looks at you like, yeah, you got a problem with that? Or I mean, is he kind of... Oh, know, no. He's he like, like, go. He goes, he goes <clears> out. He, 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 we had rehearsal. He goes, yeah, man, sounds great. Cool. Yeah. And, and if you know, and the live endings are different than the record because the record mm-hmm. fades. The, the live ending is real. Is The drummer is leading. Mm-hmm. The, we're leading you to the water. Like you gotta, You've got to play the retard right. And mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. It, it does the fade. And then they've added this ending that, that retards, you know, da 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 then trash can ending. Exactly, exactly. I learned that term from you. You guys sang it together. That's, that's I, know. It. That, I know, that's great. You really do know it. That's the ending, and you got to know it. And and I did it, you know, and, and did the ending. He's like, yeah, man, that was it. It's like, All right. Cool. You know, I, I, like, I can I can leave now. You know? Can you play and, on a turntable? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, but he you know, could not have been nicer. And uh, so he's come back and played with us a couple of times. This past year, uh, Jay, longtime Chicago Chef. Jason Chef, Chicago bassist and lead vocalist, yeah. played the role of Getty this year. He sang wow. lead and played bass. Oh, good for him. Wow. And it was wow. so it's just the three of us and and uh and Mandel on, on guitar and uh but him singing lead and playing that stuff, which is crazy because he he nailed it. He did a great job. Didn't you do the he, uh really cool. the tribute to Rush thing that they did here? Or was that just Van Halen? Um, see, you know, all those drummer... Oh, the drummer uh, jams. The drummer jams. Yeah, yeah. I missed that. We I did Drush. That. I did Fly By Night. Oh, did wow. You? Okay. Yeah. So I'm like the one guy that's actually played with a Rush member and... I didn't get to do it, so I'm yeah. not bitter. But. You got no. You got to stay on those guys. And when you see the when you see the tribute coming up, you're like, you hit them up right away, and you're like, okay, these are my five that I want to do. I'll do any five of these. You know, I've gone back and watched you play. I'll wait on the Alex Van Halen. Kid. Oh yeah, it's a really oh, great rendition. That's a of, cool. Yeah, he, he uh, Rich, you killed it. But it goes, we got we got yeah. to do we did the Toto one. We did, I did yeah. Toto and mm-hmm. I did Led Zeppelin, mm-hmm. which were a blast. I bet. And then the next two was like, I missed Van Halen, I missed Rush. There's still no, Collins, I wasn't available. I missed Phil. I'm like, man, yeah. all my other favorites I didn't get to do, you know, but I, I was thrilled to do get the call and do Led Zeppelin and Toto. See, For I, people who don't know what the drummer's jam is, it's a, this thing we do in Nashville. It's a tribute. It's a yeah. tribute. And we have all these all-star players, band guys, uh, and lead singers and, and, and they just pick an artist. So this particular one was Toto. Yeah. And, and, and all these incredible players. And they all they do is just rotate and switch out drummers. Mm-hmm. You know, So each drummer, you have to be invited. Each drummer just picks a different song. And everybody, everybody does one song. Yeah. And it is an absolute blast because it's all these incredible it is, yeah. players. It and, is. And, we uh, raise money. And they, and they raise money for charity. Yeah. And they sell out every show. And they do one, I don't know, maybe two or three a year maybe. And, um, yeah. But it's, it's a really... It's a that, really it really cool just event. speaks to the you know the community spirit that we have in Nashville. I mean, you know, you've yeah. been around these other you know music markets, the Atlantas, the Los Angeles, the mm-hmm. New Yorks, and we just have it's a special place. Nashville, it really is. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. And there's so much. What I love is that there's so many different genres here, and so many different players, and um, it's and I've been you know I've been telling people that for years, and they and a lot of my LA buddies w- didn't get it or didn't understand until they came here, yeah. either moved here or just came here and visited, and like. Like I had no idea there was a blues bar in Printer's Alley, you know. You yeah. can go see a you can see that kick ass blues contemporary blues band, you know, yes. or you can Stacy Mitchart, the, right? There's, there's country stuff, yeah. but there's there's R and B stuff and and just all sorts of stuff going on here. There is that people have no idea and it's it's always been that way. I That's, think I think words getting out now, you know, it's obviously. Music look City, at our traffic. USA, you know, hey, man. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, look at the traffic for sure. Mm-hmm. Did everybody here play in their parents' basement? Like I did. I had my bedroom. Yeah. Oh we yeah. On practice pads, right? No, I mean, if they weren't home, I would like light it up. And then sometimes when they were home, they were just like, that's Richie. He's just practicing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Both houses I grew up in had a basement, mm-hmm. underground basement. And, yeah. and of course, too. every band I was in 
hey, I was the rehearsal house, you know, and we'd set up a little PA and a room about this size, you know, mm-hmm. and and so every band I was in in high school and college, well, not not so much college, but high school, um, I was the band house, you know. Yeah. I, one or just my drum stayed set up and had a little PA. Did you go down there and, you know, woodshed for a while? Oh, God, yeah, every day, man. Every what would you day. play to? Would you play to CDs, to cassettes, or radio? Oh, or my whatever came vinyl, on? vinyl. Did you? I mean, I'm, I would, old, I would I'm just, old enough. It was all vinyl and, and tape. It was all vinyl and tape. And it was just, it was just, I played everything, you know. I mm-hmm. would literally come down and, and play Count Basie and work on that kind of stuff and work on Buddy Rich and, and Butch Miles type stuff count basic stuff and then i'll turn around and, and play rush you know or yeah. or, or, or play the commodores or, yeah, but didn't or the needle skip just, i mean because from the vibration of the drums yeah no i i set my turntable up i had it on really solid um uh, piece of the shelving behind me and then we had the turntable on thick thick mattress foam oh yeah i'd set it on literally on foam so it just absorb and would play drop the needle so of course if i'm trying to learn how to play a lick i just you know pick it up and drop it and then later i got smart and would put stuff on cassette mm-hmm. <laughs> make my mixtape yeah you know on cassette later yeah. later in life you know and then but uh, cds you know i, I didn't grasp get cds till yeah. they became the 90s, widely yeah. available yeah and, well, yeah, and they would was, skip too mateys i they finally would got, though you're right i finally got rid of all my cassettes you know i like had just boxes and boxes of cassettes and i was like you know what i mean the, the, we the, the world is at our fingertips here with spotify and all this and i you know yeah, i resisted true. spotify for a long time I did and, too. and the more i you know you work with people and then these young whippersnappers come up these young band leaders and they send you a spotify playlist for the show and you're like wow i I'm going to have to do this. And that was the catalyst for me. Was- well, me too. That was exactly what they started doing with some of these, a lot of events where I'm in the house band. Like, well, so, okay, so like the ACM Awards. Yeah. Okay, it's, uh, I'm in the, we're in, we're the house band for, there's a live, there's a live concert. The ACMs are a three day weekend. But the day prior to the award show and the day, and the day of the award show, there, there's a big, huge live concert. And there's, you know, usually 40 plus artists, which means 80 something songs. Mm. Well, you get the original versions. We get a big Spotify playlist sure. and, and you get familiar with the original version. But then you then you find and this is where Spotify is, does, doesn't do you any good is you find the live versions and you got to learn those. That's YouTube. And that's and that's yeah YouTube or, or just whatever. And sometimes they'll actually send you one. You know, yeah. thank God. But and then those usually get jumped to dump to Dropbox, you know. So Spotify is a big help learning the original versions. But within the band, it's usually um, we'll find the live versions and, and we'll send we'll we'll have the live versions in Dropbox and you know. And what's that after party where we go to? Yeah. The ACM after that's party, the, the jam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's the jam. Okay, yeah, yeah. There, there's a jam the night of the award show, right after the award show, yeah. and, every, and all the artists come to that. You guys have done it, you know. And uh, and it's really cool because it, it's current artists that are on the show, and then really you know, some maybe some legacy big big artists who might not have performed on the show, but they were a presenter or they're just there to do some different events. And so, like this year, we had um, Clint Black come in, and Tracy Lawrence, and Dina Carter, and and Carolyn Dawn Johnson, and you know a, a handful. But That's great. Um, but Spotify is you know. It is very useful. And those playlists are very useful when yeah. you got to learn forty or fifty songs. You For know, sure. And, and uh, no, it, it's I guess it's a necessary evil. With, you know, the the, the more I learn about uh, you know Hollywood, and the more time I spend on like TV sets or movie sets, it's a lot of hurry up and wait. What's it like <sighs> working with on the uh, Nashville show? You did that for seven years, right? Yes, Johnny it is. Ex- yeah, did yeah. Well, uh, yeah, six six seasons. We were there all six seasons. We were on the pilot episode and all the way to the finale. We weren't on every episode, but every season we, we would we would do many episodes per season. But um, it's exactly that because they shot it like a movie, and so you would do a few takes of a certain scene, right. and then you're sitting around waiting while they reset and do different camera angles. So what they would always do on. Uh, 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 a scene that we used a lot was the Bluebird set, the Bluebird Cafe set, yeah. and so they would shoot it many times from different angles, from the side and, and from the front. And then the last shot of the day was always they would shoot it from the drummer's perspective. So they would remove the wall behind me and either shoot a camera right over my shoulder, yeah. or um, or they would shoot it. Um, 
and I wouldn't be in the shot, and they'd have the camera right where the drum throne would be, and they'd be shooting it, you know, Over your from my perspective, the way I would see it. Interesting. You know? so, now, was it different so, directors yeah, there was all the time? A lot of waiting, yeah, a lot of waiting, a lot of sitting around. Was it different directors all the time, or one yeah, guy? Yeah, no, yeah. it was always, it was, they would have different directors every other episode, mm-hmm. you know, so we worked with a lot of different directors. Uh, uh, one of them was even Eric Stoltz, you know, who's gone on to do a lot of oh, yeah. TV yeah. and movies, and mm-hmm. he was Mask. great. And, um, Good for him. Yeah. But mm-hmm. that was a lot of fun to do because we shot the first season. We shot, you know, at the Opry House and at and um, we shot all over town. And then later on, they built that Bluebird set. So that was actually on the soundstage, and it looked exactly like the Bluebird. It was down to the square inch. And you every, can't get a crew into the can, Bluebird. It's too it, tiny. Exactly, and that's what that how and that's the magic. They could they could remove that wall behind me, and you'd never know, you know. Yeah. But but. Um, we shot everything on location. So we did a lot of, of shooting at the Ryman, of course, the Opry House. We shot at the Belcourt Theater a couple of times. Um, but um, it, it, it was great. It was great to be a part of it. Um, we got a lot of mileage out of that as a band. You know, the whole band wouldn't be in every episode, but we were we were, we were Reina's band, and Reina is the, was the star. And if we weren't shooting with Reina, we were shooting with uh, you know Connie Britton. We were shooting with Chip Eston, who was Deacon, who was the lead male. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so we got to shoot with with both actors uh, on you know much of different scenes. She must have been so a pleasure. Was, she was uh, she was a blast and just yeah. sweetheart. Really, very very nice lady. And you know, I, we we'd come on set. And she goes, oh, my band, you know, like give us a big hug. Just absolutely, just sweetheart, sweetheart. Just really nice lady and um, just and total pro, man. If it if we had to do 100 takes, you'd do 100 takes and just, I mean. That's you, awesome. You don't realize until you see it, like have, have, the way you've seen it, you know, uh, you do an acting work and whatnot. You don't realize how great those people are until you see them on set and being so consistent and just like a musician in that they're doing it, doing it consistent every single take and, and that intensity and that perfection most every single take you sure. know and um you you have a, a better appreciation for how hard their their job is mm-hmm. and um and how professional they are and some of them I, and chip chip is the master at this and we all laugh at this we've gotten to be really good friends with chip eston you know charles yeah. eston and we we in real life he's actually a really great musician singer and writer so we actually go out and have been doing tour dates with him for six years now That's great. chip is the master at just being a complete goofball hilarious because he's a, actually a great comedian he was on that show whose line is it anyway he was really? on that show for what? many years did not know that it's hilarious i did not know so that. in between takes he's goofing off and laughing and just have us crying laughing and i'm bending over i mean just crying and he can flip a switch turn around and then being just dr- dramatic brooding right. you know just this this dark dark guy in a horrible mood just flip a switch That's and amazing. do that yeah, and it's, he would he would do that on set every you know all the time, and and we're trying to get our act together, and we're back there laughing, trying to you know get our composure and get back <laughs> get back in the in the mode of okay, I got to count this song off and out like you know I'm playing it, and and I you know it take me a whole another take just to get get back in character you know and get serious, and that, he's just can just turn around and do it. It reminds like, me of a voice actor who uh, I don't did know how all, they do that. He did all the promo promo voices on like NBC, and mm-hmm. I want to say it was the same guy, but. You remember the promos where they put like, you know, friends in ER, you know, uh, tonight and an all new friends, you know, oh, yeah, Ross yeah. goes down, you know, and, have that oh, right, and, then, right. and then on an all new ER, you know, it was the same dude, you know, flip a switch. That's right. amazing. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty good, Jim. Thank you. That was. Yeah. Yeah. But he literally, he, he would, he'd be turning around facing the band, just us just goofing, being idiots like we normally are. And then he could just turn around and be Deacon in yeah. character. You know? That's and really impressive because uh, you know who's playing is it anyways. And Connie could do that too. Connie was yeah. That's a that's an improv based show. And then oh, it is total Nashville improv. is a dramatic based show. Right. And then he's singing. And you know Michael Michael Knox produced some sides for him, so I yes. almost played on that. But we were yep. we were out on the road with Aldine. So yep. You know, you know the thing about the acting aspect of it is, uh, I was talking to your buddy at your birthday party a couple of weeks ago. Oh um yeah. Well, I can't remember his name. Scott Getland. Scott, and he, yeah. he just landed a uh, job on, a job on um, Ray Donovan. Yeah. Which will so, be amazing. For some reason, I felt compelled to co- talk to him. I wanted to you know, talk to him about acting and stuff like that, because I always wonder, I'd probably be one of those guys that could pigeonhole myself into a certain kind of role, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And being a voice actor, 
uh, or voice talent rather, mm-hmm. it's tough for me to get into. I know the things I can pull off. Like last night, I was asked mm-hmm. to do a video game character, and I'm going, "Yeah, this just isn't me. You know, I can't, I can't talk like this all the time." You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And but I couldn't find what the character voice was. So he and I were breaking it down. I said, "You know, isn't acting like?" Just getting back to when you were six or seven years old and you, you were playing army with your friends or whatever, you know, the, and you really got into the role. I said, isn't a lot of the fight of acting, and this is my, my question for you, trying to get back to being like a six-year-old mindset? Oh, it's pretend. Right. Yeah. And just pretend. letting yourself pretend. Make believe. Yeah. yeah. Make believe, yeah. But I mean, isn't yeah. it funny? Because I mean, it's tough for a lot of people to do once your brains are hardwired as adults, right? Oh, we, we unlearn yeah. all this stuff. But yeah, that consistency... Yeah, it gave me a new respect just watching yeah. them up close because yeah. those are twelve and sixteen hour days mm-hmm. with us shooting the show. I, I've, so I've been there been all a, day watching. I've been a huge Avengers fan as of late. If you can't tell by my new phone case, <laughs> Iron Man. Oh, wow. that's cool. Um, yeah, I know I'm a dork. But how, how old are you? Okay. I, I know. <laughs> but you know what? There are a lot of guys like me out there that are watching these movies. And and you know they're they're amazing movies, right? That that they came out with over this eleven year span since you know Robert Downey Jr. reinvented a C list B list character from Marvel, which was Iron Man. I never can imagine oh, yeah. Iron Man being a B list character. He was for for the Marvel. Wow. I mean, he wasn't Spider Man. He wasn't the Hulk. He was like yeah, he was like a, he was like yeah. a tertiary character for you know in the comic books. Sure. So they bring him to an A list with the powerful performance that Robert Downey Jr. brought to the the table oh, sure. yeah. um and it's amazing because i've always wanted to talk to you about this about attitude in the crash in the crash book now yeah. available on amazon i like how i like how you're promoting my book for me thank you, <laughs> thank you. um terrence howard was in that movie and i know i'm going down a uh, uh, rabbit hole here but it, it's relevant um <laughs> is it it is <laughs> Terrence what, Howard. What kind of drums did he play? <laughs> <laughs> we talk about anything that comes up on the show. <laughs> Terrence Howard played uh, Rhodey, which became War Machine in the later movies. So oh. he was one of the key characters in the first movie. Evidently, through the grapevine, I had heard that he had been kind of a pain in the ass to work mm. with. You know they what I mean? replaced him with Don Cheadle. Right. Yeah. And look what happened. Yeah. Over the course of this whole thing playing out, Avengers Infinity War comes out, which leads to Avengers Endgame. Endgame is the biggest movie of all time. Did it, did it oh my. finally replace Avatar? Replaced they did Avatar. Because we were talking about that. Really? Recently. Wow. I didn't know that. I saw Amazing. part of it on... 11 uh, years. Yeah, I saw part of it on American Airlines. You know, when you're uh, sitting on a flight that's like longer than two and a half hours, you've got the TV screen in the back yeah. of the seats there, and you're yeah. like, oh my God, I can catch up on all my movies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's yeah. funny, but it relates to what you're talking about. Raina... Or, or Connie and uh, Chip being so just their attitude they were fun to work with oh yeah that goes a long yeah. way and the whole cast is like that Claire, yeah. Bo- Claire Bowen and everybody they're just a great great cast and they're all and they all really were really are singer writer musicians yeah you know, uh, uh, um, the only thing about that show that bugged you know. the crap out of me was that they'd shoot, shoot a scene hey we're gonna be on the pedestrian bridge you know and I'm a major A-list celebrity just having a conversation about life and whatever hey let's go get a drink at Tootsie's that no, no. that doesn't happen no. <laughs> yeah you know yeah we had to come on we had to clue them in on on, on a lot of of real Re- reality war yeah. alerts on. All right, here's There's what always, here's what a star would really do here in Nashville. And yeah, like from the, the, literally the pilot episode. Interesting. We, they, were at, they would ask us, would would Martina McBride or, or or Faith Hill really do this? And we're like, well, actually, if there are floor monitors on the stage and she's got in ear molds, no, there probably wouldn't be floor monitors. So get rid of these monitors <laughs> yeah. if she's on ears. You know? Oh, we didn't think of that. Yeah. You know? Just little little detail stuff like that. You guys you should know? have gotten paid and, for that consulting. And, yeah, I mean, there's there's all sorts of things they would ask us because some of the characters were were composite. Like Raina's character was literally a, a composite of, okay, here's this superstar, you know, female, like, big uh, giant artist, you know. So and, is Connie a, a, a combination of Carrie Underwood and Faith Hill? I don't, I don't. I wasn't thinking Carrie Underwood. I I, I thought yeah, Faith. Yeah, I don't know about yeah Faith Carrie. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking just Faith. Yeah, Faith just, and she was the age of Martina. Faith. Yeah, well, yeah, know. Martina. Yeah, because they because she was you know Raina's character was was an established superstar, so she wasn't twenty five. She was right. You know, maybe the threat 40. was like the Carrie, uh, the girl coming up. 
was the yeah movie. yeah yeah. She so was like eat, the, all those uh, characters were kind of composite. So hey, were you guys paid um, AFM or SAG as actors? Depends on if we had lines or not. When we were talking, we were actors, and so if we were just musicians and playing, right. then we were paid for the union. So you so, had a couple lines here and there. Oh, we well, yes and no. So there were many scenes that we got to improv and say, just be band guys, just just banter and be your usual jackass self, you know, which we could do great. This was easy. <laughs> awesome. We pulled that off. Every time we got to shoot those scenes, they would get edited out. And, right. and we would put this time in and shoot these scenes. And, and there, I remember in the pilot, <laughs> in the pilot, they, 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 shot, they shot a scene where we're all side stage watching... Hayden Hayden's character, you know, the young little pretty blonde. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're all Randa's band, so we're side stage. Watch it, and, and they're like, "Okay, just just riff on her, just just do your thing," you know. And I'm like, "Really? Can we curse?" Like, "No, you can't curse," you know. And 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 so we're just ripping on her as we're watching her, and, and the camera's shooting us band guys, and we're just ripping her to shreds, saying all this, saying all this stuff. The director loved it because we improved everything. It's really cool. Didn't make the final cut. <laughs> yeah, you should have got, got a copy of it. Chuck. You know, and uh, there were episodes where some of us got lines, and there was another one where we were in the Bluebird, and we had to do this scene about ten times, and we were at, at the end of the night. Deacons, the bands, it, it, we were wrapping up, and we we're getting our stuff. We're about to walk out the door, and and Deacon says something to us, and we're going, "Okay, yeah, man, we'll see you tomorrow. See you at rehearsal." And we did about you know five or six tapes, and we just Im- improved all these lines, and um. And we improv interaction between us and a couple of other the stars who were there on that episode and took all this time to shoot it. Right. Same thing. Yeah. Didn't make the final edit. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Because, yeah. So, so, yeah, would have been paid as an actor and a musician on that episode. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> what a great experience, man. What a great no, it, experience. it was. It was great. And it, then and then uh, you uh, did the, worked with Alabama, that iconic oh, yes, band, for yes. a good eight years, right? Yes. Yes. That was an awesome, that awesome. That had to be fun. It was Fantastic. That, that all came about where I had um, worked for several years with Randy Owen, you know, the lead singer of Alabama. Me and most of the Six Wire guys were, were in his band. He was doing solo dates. Um, and and his solo show was, you know, 90% Alabama hits because he wrote a lot of them. And then some other stuff, he was promoting his current album at that time that John Rich had produced. And this is like in 2010, 2011. Um, or even before that, even. I'm sorry. Um, and so I did that for five or six years. And so in 2011, Alabama decided to, we're going to reunite, do a few dates, and just kind of see if there's some interest out there. So... We went out and did a handful of the big, big festivals, and lo and behold, the interest was there. the The fan, the demand for that band was there, and so we went from doing nine or ten dates the first year to um, doing fifty dates, and it, that's what it was from then on out. It was fifty or sixty dates, maybe fifty or fifty five dates a year. Yeah, big dates. They were, you know, they're like you guys. They're playing big, big arenas and the big festivals and and yeah. uh, maybe a few big casinos and. Uh, a lot of fun. I mean, it was great. You know, they have forty-three number one songs, and um, and then a whole lot of top five. That's so beautiful. We would run the show as quick as we could, just to, just to get in as many songs as we could. You know, yeah. so uh, it's I played. I've been very blessed to play with a lot of big iconic people, and awesome. I don't know any show where I played a show where every song was a number one. I mean, yeah. I was pretty. Wow. I know you guys are encroaching on that now. Uh, you know, but it was. It was really cool, and and the they have a serious forty or fifty year fan base. I That's, mean, these people have been following them for yeah, years. Yeah, grandkids and grandparents oh, coming to the same it's, show. It's nuts. It's nuts, you know. And so there would be a lot of forty or fifty year olds there with their college age, uh, you know, kids. Yeah, because you know, so there's a lot of that. Yeah. Um, but it, it was great, and and um, I did you know I did that from uh, 2011 till the end of 18, and. Um, and there, what was going on was, um, uh, you know, I hated I, I, I hated to leave, but what happened was six wire. We became so busy the last two or three years. I've been I was flying in between gigs, so I would I would just red eye an overnight or drive in between all the six wire dates and all the Alabama dates. So I wasn't getting any sleep. It was just I'd literally run off stage and get in a car and go catch a flight 
with either act to make the other the show for the other act you know? and so it was just it was just physically impossible because Alabama started adding more dates six wire started adding a whole lot more dates because yeah. we started getting a lot busier in the past two years and so it was just uh, I couldn't keep doing it wasn't fair I couldn't keep be an Alabama's drummer and go, oh, I gotta have a sub. You know, there is no subbing. You don't you don't sub that gig. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. not just simply not done. So I did have to sub a couple times when when I, I had some family things going on or like a wedding or some other stuff. But um, or kids graduate like my son graduated college, daughter graduates high school. You know, I don't want to miss that because they, of course they're on weekends. You know, right in mm-hmm. the middle of May or June, the height of touring season. Sure. So. But. Typically, you don't sub Alabama, so so anyway, <laughs> did that for a long time. It was great. Got to do some really cool recording, you know, live DVD. Uh, nice. Matter of fact, that live What's a Alabama and Friends, you know, <laughs> yeah. which I, I guess you got to work with them on the the one the Jason Aldean cut. The Alabama and Friends was um, yeah. Uh, Luke Bryan, Jason Aldean, Trisha Yearwood, yes. Jamie Johnson, Rascal Flatts. There was a big Alabama and Friends uh, yeah, album was, and yeah. live DVD. That, great record. We we did that at the at the Ryman. And it was really live. It was a blast. And Jason came down, and Luke and Tricia, and uh, we recorded and filmed. And it's it's live, and it was uh, one of the coolest things I've ever done because everybody was just on their A game, and everybody was really excited. All the the guest stars were very very excited to be there and happy to be there to play with Alabama. Yeah. And um, Tricia even told me she goes, you know, the only reason I. I'm even doing this just because I want to sing this duet with Randy. Yeah. Like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's pretty cool. strong. And and she actually came into rehearsal, and it was so cool because Trisha, Trisha, Trisha Yearwood's voice is just unbelievable. She has this, when you hear her voice raw, just in your headphones mm-hmm. with, you know, nothing on it, just this raw vocal, it's absolutely beautiful perfect yeah her pitch is perfect the tone this fullness you know she has this this linda ronstadt uh and i and another uh, there's another um i'm blanking but um it's a round just tone. just this yeah. round rich yeah. tone but she has this range she can hit the high notes as well but it's just it's just perfect and the first time we we played this big ballad and I mean, I could barely hold it together just listening to her, her yeah. and Randy duet, you know. And I got the voice right there, and I'm just going, "Oh my gosh, this is so, it's just so incredible." Yeah. And, and she sounds just like the record. You know, of course, I, she's I, a what sweetheart. I wonder sometimes. I but, hear a song, and like you're saying, but holding it together. Which oh man, the I'm just, I'm just sitting there watching yeah. her. I'm not even looking at my mm-hmm. music. There is sheet music there because you want to make sure you play the arrangement perfect. Well, I knew the song. I mean, it's, it's one that we play. So I like, I knew it. But I'm just sitting there playing. Watching her going, oh my god, this is hit you so in the, hit you in the great. feels, right? Oh man, yeah. yeah. Just there's a song out. by Brad Paisley called uh, "Letter to Me." It's a great song. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah it is. And it's like you know, in the car, I'll try and sing it. And then Kenny Chesney's mm-hmm. got one too. Um, uh, it's basically. Um, Oh man, I can't remember the name of it. But it basically, you know, the guy in the song uh, gets a girl pregnant, makes a mistake. Oh, there goes my life. There goes my life. Oh, oh yeah, my yeah, god. Yeah, I have a daughter. That that one killed. Right. Me. That one. You ever I try mean, and sing a song in the car, uh, and then you know you can't. You start choking up. Oh, it happens yeah. to me all the time. God, you're so uh, sensitive. Uh, <laughs> I know. Well, okay. I I I, I, I got a, I got another great moment where I can't like keep my act together. You know, not that I'm gonna sit here and name drop all day. But all right, so the I. I was fortunate enough to work with Dolly. Uh, got to record Who? tour with Dolly. Yeah. <laughs> hey, who's that? Yeah, you might have heard of her. She's kind of a big deal. You dropped something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> same thing. As, same thing as Trisha. First time. What's the hell? <laughs> I've been doing that all afternoon. So the first time, you know, in the category of keeping my act together, mm-hmm. and I'm being polite here. I could have said keeping my, you know, ass yeah, together. That's fine. Anyway, the first time I recorded with her. In the studio, and we're doing, um, I think it was a ballad, but it was the same thing. I had met her and played with her and done some things, played live, and, you know, I mean, I knew. But it was a scale, stripped-down band, and so it weren't many musicians. And she starts singing, and it's the same thing. It's that raw vocal just right here mm-hmm. in my ear, and I had cranked it up so I could just hear all Dolly, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit of me, a little bit of acoustic guitar, and Dolly on 11, just on stun. Yeah. You know, and she starts singing, and it's and she has her voice. She always had that angel, just crystal bell tone, just this pure, pure angel voice. Yeah. Well, as she got, um, you know, 
a little bit older. It, it had this little bit of a rasp to it, just just tiny, tiny, mm-hmm. tiny. And she starts singing, and I could. By the time I got to the first chorus, I'm just like, I got my head down, and I'm just like, oh my god, I can't believe. And and I'm still playing. I'm playing confidently, playing playing correctly, but I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, I'm hearing that voice I've heard my whole life in its absolute perfection. Yeah. And it's perfectly in tune, and it's got this emotion and passion to it. And and she's just singing, and she doesn't require twenty takes. I mean, it's like yeah, one or two takes, and it's it's you better be rolling. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. And she's singing, and 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 the only thing is like it's. The only reason you do a second take was well, she's like she's like well, I think I can do it better. Like oh hell no, that was fine. Yeah. First take was perfect. It was great. No, I think I can do it better. You know that. Oh okay, you know. But the first time I, but it was that it was one of those moments though. The same thing, same thing with Trisha. Just you just hear this perfection, this voice, and it's like I just hope I can keep my act together because yeah. it's so inspiring. It's well, so, you sing too. Did you get to sing with Dolly? I did get to do some background things in the studio. That's great. Yeah, we got that's to nice. do some stuff, which I mean, that's is really heavy. cool. There was this one thing. She was trying out different singers. She wanted to get the perfect blend for this one harmony thing. And she had each uh, several of us come up and sing with her. And so I'm standing next to her singing just two-part harmony. That wasn't intimidating at all. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, here's here's a question for both you know, of you. Yeah, sure. You so, know, here you and are. that was really cool. Yeah, getting an opportunity that a lot of people would kill for. You, mm. Not everybody's going to be able to have that opportunity. Uh, yes, true. Uh, what was true. it? I'm and I, I'm thankful. thinking about different questions to ask that are kind of uh, curveball questions for both, you know, Rich and, and whatever right. else we have. What was the one gig you showed up to and you're like, wow, I'm out of my league? <laughs> if there was one. You're really confident. You 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 kind of well, always, Chuck is too. He wouldn't uh, be able to get on stage with all those know, people. I don't. Yeah. I'm not out of your league, but you know, like I can't well, believe I'm here. Well, those. I mean, I, I think there's more. Well, those Dolly, there. Alex Lifeson, Alex Cooper. Yeah. Um, sure. Um, Michael McDonald. Mm-hmm. Here I go. You know, I'm dropping names all day. Yeah. Uh, there, well, there have been a few. Michael Bolton. You've got They're a perfect. You, but you know what? You've got the equity. Absolutely. Well, uh, well, that was the thing. It's like okay, I wouldn't be here if they didn't think I could cut it. So. Yeah. Right, you know, there's that. Not to sound overconfident, but there's a reason that each person is on that stage. You've all been invited. There's a reason you've all or have reached that level that mm-hmm. you're in that league. So, but I mean, you know, but yeah, ten year old Chuck pitch, in the basement. Absolutely, you know what I mean. Pinch myself, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I, I would never, say more, yeah. more of dream, like uh, dream venues or experiences, oh, like yeah. so. You know, so that was for, for you. So it was, was the venue. Yeah, it was that's ho- a good point. Hollywood yeah. Bowl. You know, yeah. oh, you're like, yeah, hey, see? Beatles played here, Hendrix played here, everyone's oh, played. Dude, here. I see the picture of you. I guess it was at the Bulldog Stadium gig. Where it's oh. like the sea of people, and you're just you're counting yeah. off. Or something. Oh, what's a? You, <clears throat> it's a picture of you from behind stadium, um, <clears throat> and it's like that for me when I was in my basement playing. Yeah. That's I've, what that's what I want. I've I had think a couple that's the, of those, yeah. yeah. A couple know? stadium gigs were like that. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely, um, and I'm sure they venue. feel a lot different than you anticipated because you got yeah. the ears and stuff. Oh and, yeah, yeah. It, you're right though. It's more. Some I think it's more of the venue mm-hmm. was intimidating or or, or or really just like just you know make just unbelievable to me more um, more so than the yeah. the artist because maybe you've already rehearsed for that artist or you played with them or there's a comfort factor but there's only you only get one take to go out and play the Hollywood Bowl for the first time you know or yeah. for me it was Royal Albert Hall doing Royal oh, Albert wow. Hall with, with Richard Marks yeah. yeah I worked with Richard for many years as well. Um, I would do all that in between other things I was doing, you know. He didn't tour heavy, so it, it was perfect. You know? He's but, got the money. But He's Royal a- Albert with Richard was a, was yeah. a big deal, and that's all over YouTube. There's a lot of cool footage from that. I remember taking a tour and, of Radio City Music Hall, and, and I think Rush yeah. had played there at one point, and I remember they you know, brought us across the stage. And I yeah. Like, this then is that- like where Neil was right here, probably. You know? <laughs> Yeah, you are so funny. He is a, such a Neil Peart fan. Everyone wow. is, but I mean, well, he's, is he's yeah. like he's heavy. Oh, I don't think I'm that bad. Oh, come on, that's funny. Am I that bad? I'll have to get you a sign something from him at some point. If you can even yeah. get talk to him, he doesn't talk. No, to I'll him. get him from he's the Sabian guys. <laughs> yeah. I'll get a second yeah. hand. I just want to sit down and play yeah. his drums. You know? Oh yeah, no kidding. That's and it, they look so uncomfortable like, to play because he's got the snare drum up, to, up by his belly button, thanks to Freddie Gruber. I know, yeah. yeah. I've never said Chuck, do you angle that. your snare drum weird like me? From like, I got that from like Liberty and Tony Thompson and uh, yeah. Phil Collins. I, and- I, I, <clears throat> I have a slight, I'm more like, 
flat. Well, that's about like mine's, no, 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 mine, mine's slightly tilted. Mine's yeah. maybe not that steep, yeah. but because I like to catch the rim uh, a little, some, but. Oh. Um, yeah, I do have a slight tilt to mine. Cause oh, I, yeah. Most 95% of the time I'm playing match grip. Oh, 99% mm -hmm. of the time I'm and hitting so, a rim And shot. so I, you know, I like to uh, what was it? have a little tilt to it. Yeah. You know? Todd Zuckerman has got a high snare drum. Yeah. And then he yeah, plays well, he match. he plays traditional. He does, though, but he switches yeah. to, to match. But he's like, he, he's like. Yeah, I can't do that, man. I gotta have, I gotta, he's got I gotta beautiful have technique. Oh, God, he Oh, he does. Yeah. I wish stuff. I could play traditional like that. I, yeah. I lost that ability after drum corps in college. I, I can't. I can't yeah. do that. It's like guys, they, they made the traditional grip <laughs> for guys who wore the drum on the side for leading right. troops into battle. I mean, that's that's why that's where right. it came from. Yeah, I you still know? do it. I instinctively do it. When I'm playing big band or yeah. any kind mm -hmm. of jazz, I, or I, I will instinctively do it. I will play traditional grip. Just sure. That's the way I learn how to play jazz, you know? Yeah. Just just all the ghost note stuff and all that. Yeah. That's just what I do. I, I don't even think about it. But and if I'm playing, if I want to play something a little softer, um if I'm doing something kind of a mid a mid a ballad or something that where I just have to make myself play softer, I will go to traditional grip sure. and mm. just and just do all the little ghost note yes. little finesse stuff because it just it forces me to because I I don't I don't instinctively play a huge backbeat like a Stuart Copeland mm -hmm. big traditional I, I don't Rap. do that Zuckerman he he's got a backbeat yeah. on a he does and, and I just I uh, yeah I break my wrist. I'd break my fingers totally. off. Totally. Yeah. I, I. Yeah. So Chuck, with all these years of experience in Nashville and all, you know, all the, th all that you're bringing to the table, all the insight, mm -hmm. if there was a young person, a creative of any type, a musician that wanted to move to, to a Nashville, what would you, what would you say? Hmm. Don't. Yeah. Run away. That's Run what Tully would say. Tully's, Tully's like, it's a failure business. Don't do it. <laughs> There's an insult. There's an insult. Tully, that's great. Oh, man. Uh, I would say, are you used to traffic? Have a good car. Make sure your air conditioner works. Yeah. Um, Bring some money. Yeah. 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 As a practical concern, absolutely have as much savings as you can have because you're not going to move here immediately and start working. Um, even though I, you know, I'll, I'll talk about my history later, but uh, about that, but mm -hmm. it, it can relate to that. But uh, no, I would say um, if, okay, if you're an aspiring musician um, who want to move here, I would say, yeah, have, have a way to make money, have a way to survive mm -hmm. while you're out hustling and trying to meet people and, 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 and and spread out, you know, network within the the music industry, but have a way to survive, whatever it is, whether it's waiting tables or a day job, or 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 you've got some kind of band you can play in and make a little money, great, you know, but have a have a survival plan, you know, yeah. have a way to eat, because um, I was lucky in that I did have, I moved to town with a a band a gig who was working a little bit, and so just through dumb luck I never had a day job I never had a I never had a job where I wasn't playing music I'm just one of those lucky guys yeah. but I but I moved to town with a gig you know, there was a gig waiting on me. It was just a bar gig and just playing around town a little bit. It wasn't Broadway, but it was just playing playing different bar gigs within a, a two hour radius of Nashville. Cover band, cover band gigs, and then I was doing the karaoke tracks, the sound alike tracks. Sure. So I had to wait. It was just me by myself, me in a Toyota with one set of drums and a couple suitcases, and I couch surfed. I slept. I, I slept with uh, friends' places. Uh, uh, my girlfriend, who's now been my wife for thirty years, my girlfriend at the time, Kathleen. Yeah would sleep on her couch i didn't have a place to live you know i mean yeah. I, I just was couch surfing in it because because i was on the road a good bit you know and so i would if i was in town I'd be in town monday through wednesday and then i was going out and playing around here or we would go to texas and play the whole texas bar circuit yeah. and play i'd be gone for two or three weeks at a time so i didn't really get my get a place of my own till six months of moving here and even then i shared it with two other musician guys and and i just stored cases there and had a bed like i didn't uh yeah. lived over i lived over the gazebo in antioch you know yeah. like i think which is the law then everybody if you moved to town that's where you had to live yeah that's and, funny. keep your expenses low when you move oh here. yeah my yeah. overhead was nothing seriously no I, I remember me and kurt and tully living with each other to an inappropriate age like into our <laughs> early to mid 30s still living together and i, I 
mean, like, oh, like the rent was in, like, oh. our bills were like 500 bucks. And it's like, right. well, I can right. spend 500 bucks before breakfast now. You know, it's <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I, I had a beater car that was paid for. I paid cash for a car in college because I was playing a bunch of frat parties and actually making really good money. Um, so I had no car payment. It's very, very little survival overhead, just eating. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I can remember, but I, I got a great story. I would, on Sunday nights, I would go play the Nashville Palace. Yeah. With this killer, killer band, Matt McKenzie and Bruce Bolton and, and, uh, oh God, uh, all these wonderful players. And they would have, there would always be leftover food in the kitchen. And there would always be this huge platter of baked potatoes <laughs> left over. And I'd walk through there, and, and they're like, yeah, man, if you want to grab one or two. I would fill up my pockets with baked potatoes. <laughs> they were just going to throw them out. I would fill my pockets with them. I'd walk out of there with like six or eight of them. They're like, hey, what's you know, in your for pants? Some, for some reason, when you and, said baked potatoes, I thought mashed I mean, potatoes. No, I mean I'm baked like, potatoes. You have, and they were still hot. I'm envisioning mashed potatoes in your and pockets. And I would, man, I would eat those damn things for two days, three, yeah. three days. Have you ever had the, yeah. uh, the baked potatoes at the baked potato in Los Angeles? No. They're like this big. Oh, are they? They get the biggest spuds in the world. They slice them open and oh, they all have a theme. God. There's a Mexican one. There's an Italian one. And they stuff oh. them with stuff. They're I've never proud. eaten there. I've just gone there and, you know, drank and watched the band. Yeah. <laughs> drank and got my drum lesson from, yeah. you know, whoever. It's a two drink minimum, uh, a right. drum lesson, and a giant spud. Yeah. Oh, I, I yeah. saw Dodgers games. But, that was about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but you know, back to your question. Yeah, you know, keep your expenses low, but do your musical homework. Do your homework, study. I mean, my God, I was listening to everything b before I arrived here. But then when I arrived, I did not have much of a country music background. Shocker, I know, yeah. coming, <laughs> coming out of music school. And uh, like many of us, yeah. um, and man, I was just studying. I was listening to Top 40 Country Radio at the time, and at the same time, studying um, everything Owen Bradley produced, you know, all the Patsy Cline and... and, and uh, Merle all Hager, the Ray, you know, the, the shuffle, all the shuffle stuff, yeah. everything Buddy Harmon played on. And then I was, I was already, I was already very familiar with a lot of Larry London stuff. And of course, Eddie Bear's stuff. Um, but I really went back and went to the sixties and, you know, the Ray Price stuff and all the stuff Buddy Harmon did. Buddy did so much cool stuff, you know, in addition to the country stuff with Patsy Cline and all these other people, the brushwork he did, but the, the Roy Orbison stuff did and the Elvis stuff. He, he played a lot of cool stuff that was recorded here. I think he played but, on eight, something like 18,000 recordings oh, it's, or something. Oh, gosh. It's up in the, it's up in the mm. Hal Blaine numbers. I mean, it's, it's way up there. Yeah, for sure. But become a, whatever your instrument is, become a student of, of, of these different genres because if you're going to, you know, try to be a session guy or tour the major artists, you know, you're going to, you're going to be asked to, to, to play some things that might not be in your wheelhouse or yeah. might not be in your comfort zone. You better be familiar with them. Expand your vocabulary. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I would say that with <clears throat> any, any instrument. But uh, that's what I did. When I first moved here, man, I was just listening all day, every day, yeah. studying studying stuff, yeah, transcribing, right. writing out stuff. What are some of the things that grind your gears about the whippersnappers coming to town? Like, you know, just like... Just, um, just, uh, mm, um, Rich is the, yeah, I think you mentioned like you know them not, not having wanting. not okay sorry. Yeah, sorry. sorry let me tell you one thing <laughs> you were like right no, my no. what, oh, okay I would say guy singers and musicians who have not actually gone out and played gigs yeah <clears throat> they've lived in their in their parents basement whatever and their video themselves and doing all this stuff okay that's great that's fine but damn dude get out of your house go play with other musicians mm -hmm. go play rehearse, is that more and more learn, prevalent now learn songs I go out so. and do gigs who, who cares if they pay if they pay good yeah. god i played a million gigs that, <laughs> that never paid <laughs> I did a million gigs that didn't pay, you know, or paid very little. Oh my God, that's a long laugh. It is. No, yeah. they, these kids, these kids today. No, these kids. I don't know, but I mean, okay. I have a son, college age, and he's um, he well, he's been out of college for a year. Smart kid, business major. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, and he plays guitar. He's, you know, and he's talented. And and I just I say, you know, this is great. And he's always he's practicing and doing stuff. And he has a keyboard as well, you know, yeah. and, uh, and a sidebar. Any drummer, 
any drummer, I would highly recommend learn a melodic instrument, play guitar, play keys. You know, we were music majors, so we had to play piano and play other stuff. You know, I had to, you had to qualify every semester with piano. But the first lessons I took were on guitar. I started out as a guitar player, and I still I play bass. I still play bass, and and I actually played bass in a band in college. You know, but I would say, uh, you know, take lessons and study and get good lessons, but. Play with other musicians, and if you can, play with musicians who are better than you because they will make you a better yeah, player. You for know, sure. I, I gosh, I can just think of countless situations where I was the weak link playing mm-hmm. with the older guys, and they were just kicking my ass all over the place. But man, I learned a lot, and yeah. and, the, and and the nice ones were really cool and kind of coached me up and said, "Man, you know, do this instead, or go listen to this cat." You know, whether it's jazz or rock, whatever it was. You know, I had I was lucky in that I had some guys, not drummers, but other bass player guitar player sax player whatever said man go go listen to this you need to get hip to this guy listen listen to what this guy's doing or listen to this motown stuff and maybe maybe take this approach with how you're playing the kick drum and get more consistent with your kick drum pattern Mm. and feather it and do those ghost notes like do this all this in between the beat funky stuff you know like i had other non-drummers tell me Things that helped me just that were just as helpful as that oh, the drummers told me. You know, yeah. they're outside the bottle. And yeah, you know, always. And so I love it. that that's my only observation from um, younger kids is, is that I just <clears> say, <throat> man, get out. Thankfully, though, think about it. These things exist now. Exist now that didn't exist when we were in junior high and high school. You know, the the, the school of rock stuff mm-hmm. that wasn't around when we were kids. That yeah. was absolutely wonderful. That that these kids, I see some of the school of rock kids come and play at the Predators games or hockey games here. That's right, and they are unbelievable. Girls, guys, all ages. They're all junior high, high school, and they're playing their tails off. Yeah, Angie really McCray has got you know the they're school, really the good. Franklin School of Rock and yeah. the Nashville School of Rock, and they just have amazing kids, it, and her kids are fantastic. Fantastic. I mean, I would have killed for that. You know, I had to do it the organic way and just go find my buddies, whoever owned guitar. Okay, you're in my band. Come on, let's go learn some Beatles songs. You know, we just, mm-hmm. we just, I learned through my schoolmates, just whoever, we all kind of gravitate towards, yeah. towards each other. And we would just go on Saturdays. I can remember we'd go and just show up and put on records and go, let's learn that, you know? And so mm-hmm. we're learning whatever was popular at that time, whether it was Kiss or 38 Special or, or whatever, whatever was on the radio, Sticks, Journey, whatever, you know. And we would just organically learn songs and just fall into it. Yeah. And um, that was a huge part of my learning process as a you know high school guy and just trying to emulate our drumming and, yeah. and guitar heroes, you know. I have, a, I have an idea for a TV show, or at least an online show. Like get a bu- like a, a pattern of drum maybe a drumming show or something, <clears throat> but get a panel of drummers like yourselves, right. professional guys, right. and mm. you bring a guy who wants to come to town, and they got to sit down at a set of drums, mm. and you throw songs at them unrehearsed, and they got to play. On it's the like spot. On the spot. Wow. You know what I mean. So in the beginning, you That'd interview. Be tough. You've, hey, what what are some of the songs you played? You know, when you're woodshedding in your parents' basement. Well, I used to play oh. the Sticks and Kansas and Journey and everything. Okay, yeah. we 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 get it. You know, we know what kind of style. So we're gonna start throwing some. You know, songs that you're probably gonna know. But if you don't, mm-hmm. that'd there'd be, be some, interesting. There's be some licensing and stuff. So maybe it would be oh, like stuff true, in yeah. the style of yes, in yeah. the style of Slipknot. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so angry. But I mean, so, what, you know, but yeah. just, just, just no. That would be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. And, and another thing, I would, uh, you know, talk like about younger you, players. You know, Chuck and Kevin Murphy. Kevin Murphy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that'd be hilarious. <laughs> we, wouldn't, we wouldn't get anything done. And ben like Caesar. The, the three, oh yeah, yeah, three knuckleheads. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we wouldn't get anything done. We'd be laughing the whole time. Yeah, you bet. Ripping on each other the, the whole time. Oh my God! <laughs> so where can uh, people find you nowadays? But you have a website or a socials? well, yeah, you know, sixwire dot com. Okay. and of course my, you know, I'm on Chuck D Tilly, you know, Facebook and all that, all that stuff, oh, Instagram. But um, sixwire, we're on Instagram and everything else. But we um, we're doing a lot more road dates. Yeah, and um, trying to think, what we don't have any TV stuff coming up really soon but yeah. there'll, there'll be stuff in the spring i'm, I'm sure and uh um, hey we're friends look at that you know we're, we'll, you guys are already friends on the yeah. facebook oh cool, cool look at that that's where you know okay. jim from oh, okay that's right okay yeah, I love and, it. and um of course you know <laughs> facebook um instagram the sixwire.com site yeah. um 
And I know William Morris is, is they are booking more shows and things for us. And That's so great. we're hoping to add more casino dates. And yeah. what Six Wire does, uh, we were talking about earlier, but we, our band Six Wire, we, a lot of public shows we do are, we are the the backing band and we'll have three or four rock stars, usually lead singers. So we'll have, you know, the, the lead singer of Tonic or, or the former lead singer of Journey or Kansas or, or Chicago, you know, the, the, my Wally from the Romantics. Wally mm-hmm. from the Romantics. And we have a whole big, long list, very long list of a lot of rock and classic rock, you know, Mickey Thomas from Starship, you know. Yeah. We have a huge long list and we'll have a show where it's, it's nothing but hits. These each artist comes out and does their four or five big hits, and then we'll have a ninety minute or two hour show. And so we have all these. You saw us do it in Vegas, you know. Yes, wonderful. And um, we do a lot of these type shows, and so we're we're booking more of them, and we're I think we're adding more casino dates, and we do a lot of these. We just did a big thing in the city park in Coronado Island in San Diego. You know, we we did a thing where we had the John Elefante, who was lead singer of Kansas for yeah. many years. Um, did a thing we did, we did we did a good portion of the show ourselves and then we brought him out as our surprise guest he comes out and just blasts through five huge Kansas hits sure. and the people were going crazy because they had no idea he was coming you know it's pretty cool but we do a lot of city festival things where you know big open air amphitheater type things yeah. you know and, but anyway so William Morris is they're booking booking things so hopefully we'll be adding more more public dates just all over we, we, we travel everywhere and, and yeah. at the same time we, we, we do a lot of um a lot of big special event golf, golf tournament type events sure where we'll have like the Warburton where we'll have um, um, and some of those are private or they're open to the public and they're and they're you know the tickets are kind of pricey because they're raising money for mm-hmm. a charity you yeah. know, so but those are really cool events because you will never see any of these acts, you know, uh, uh, an Alice Cooper or Michael McDonald or, or, or Alex from Rush, you'll never see any of these acts in a venue that holds a thousand people and you see them up close, uh, you know, yeah. where you're standing and reach out and high five them. You will never see any of these acts in that kind of situation. And, and all of those shows will have 10 or 12 artists. And those are, you know, three and a half hour shows. Yeah. You know, but so we do a good many of those throughout the year for St. Jude and for, you know, that's our main charity that we like to work with. And so we, we do just uh, maybe keep an eye out for some of the big golf tournament type yeah. events. You know, it is a great thing. It is a great band. And you are a great drummer and you're a great guest, well, man. Thank, thank you, you so much for being here, brother. Man, we really my appreciate honor, it. my pleasure. Great to hang with you guys. Enjoy so it. cool. That's Chuck Tilly, everyone. All right, guys. Hey, this is the book, Crash Course for Success. You can get it on Amazon in two formats. And this is The Rich Redmond Show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, comment, like, share. Share, and we'll see you next time. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.